This week's episode of One of a Kind with RVD is presented by Get Blitzed. That's get-blitz.com. Get Blitz Let's Aid is nano-infused THC syrup, and it is a premium cannabis-infused syrup formulated with nanotechnology for fast-acting effects. And you can get 15% off your order when you head to get-blitz.com and use promo code RVD. Get 15% off. Head to get-blitz.com, promo code RVD, 15% off. It's one of a kind, baby. Oh, yeah. What's up, gang? This is Dominic D'Angelo of OneTrueSportTV.com, uh, SDScoops.com. I'm a dirt sheet writer. Hey, but it's one of a kind. One of a kind with RVD and holy smokes. Holy cats. We got Rob Van Dam. Rob, man, looking good, dude. Happy Sunday. Happy right Sunday. Right, happy Sunday, dude. Yeah, feeling good. Hey, is that actually an expression? Holy cats! I don't know if I've ever. I think heard I've, that. maybe I, I, I don't know. Maybe I just said. Are you Jewish? Instead. Are you Jewish? Is it like K A T C or is it C A T C? Like, <laughs> no, not Jewish. I'm a uh, Catholic, but uh, no, not K A T Z. But have you ever been to Cats Delicatessen in New York City? Hasn't everybody? Oh. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, I, <laughs> sure. I've been there once. It was great. Yeah, I liked it. Good, good. Ooh. Uh, what is it? What's their specialty? They do. Somebody might know. Bagels, right? Isn't it well, just... they do like uh, bagels, what's the know. name? Corn beef. Corn beef. Oh, oh. Their special thing is. Um. So, but whenever I see it, I always think, is that the one in Seinfeld? But I don't think it is, right? Or is it? No, it's oh. not the one in Seinfeld. Yeah, no. Mm-mm. Pastrami. That's what Greg Jacobson said. It's pastrami. Okay. Yeah, I think he's right there. But hey, we're live here on Rob Van Dam's uh, YouTube and on uh, One True Sport YouTube. Uh, feel free to use the super chat, help the shows out. Um, but we got our regular crew in here. We got some Greg Jacobson. We got uh, Triple E in here. Uh, we got some more folks hanging on out. So feel free to join in on the conversation and ask a question to Rob. Uh, Rob, you've had a busy uh, weekend. Uh, we had a little delay, and that's why we're doing it on Sunday here. Uh, you, you were on SmackDown, sir. <laughs> yes, how about that? Mm-hmm. Uh, RVD just pops up wherever he feels like. That's part of being the whole effing show, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, an invite that happened n- not with a lot of notice at all. Um, it was awesome to be there, you know, 25-year um, anniversary, I believe, for SmackDown. Uh, was last night, or I'm sorry, was Friday night the, the first show on Raw? Is that it was the first show on USA Network. Yeah, that's what I mean. Not raw. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. That is the impression that I was under because I knew they were moving, and I thought that was uh, the the first one. So, so cool. Yeah, um, they had uh, showed some legends in the crowd. Would have been cool to do it. It's cool to be part of that, though. Katie came because one, she loves WWE, and two, she loves RVD. So it was cool to have her by my side as well. Otherwise, I would have had my arm around like Teddy Long or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sheamus, you're over by oh, Sheamus. Player. <laughs> Come on, player. I'm going to book you with The Undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was cool. You guys looked like a good power couple right right on the corner there. And uh, yeah. it was neat to see because, well, so I heard through a mutual friend that you might be on there. And I was like, ooh, okay, I got definitely got to tune in then. So I... Uh, I tuned in and I was like, is he going to be Kevin Owens' mystery tag team partner? Because I knew there was the unknown guy. I was like, everybody thinks it's going to be rain. Everybody thinks, I bet they're going to pull a red herring and say it's RVD because Kevin Owens been likes RVD a lot. So that's what I thought the whole time. But it was cool to see you there. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. cool. Yeah, it was awesome. And everybody was really cool. It was cool to see everybody. Talk to uh, Mr. Paul Heyman for quite a while. Got to hang out and... Um, Always good to see him. He's obviously one of my closer friends there. But, uh, yeah, everybody, it, it was a good vibe. Good vibe. Good vibe for sure, huh? And you said it was pretty short notice, huh? It seemed like, yeah, pretty like th- that week did they kind of give you a ring and say, like, hey, come on over? It, it was a one-day notice to fly out. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, Wednesday, sorry about the short notice. You would have to leave tomorrow. But, uh, you know, are you available on Friday? And I was. Hey, Good there thing. you go. Uh, yeah, did you get to interact with, uh, like, Randy Orton or anybody? I saw he made a face at you when he was walking uh, to the ring. 
Yeah, yeah. And I saw a video, too. I didn't know that they did. I just saw it a little while ago. I guess you didn't catch it yet either. But uh, the three of them. Oh, I saw it. Yep. Uh -huh. Oh, you did? Okay, yep. yeah. What um, was that for? Was that for social media? or? Yeah, that was just on social media. So it was oh. him, Kevin Owens, and uh, Ricky. The Ricky from Seattle yeah, yeah. guy. Ricky Gibson is that, that wrestler. He was in the trailer on another planet or something. <laughs> something like that, yeah. He's like, you want to go hang out with him? <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I didn't see him in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I saw him a few couple of times, but he was way at the other end of the hallway or whatever. I didn't didn't talk to him. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty neat to see. When I, I saw him like look over there, I was like, oh, he's he's looking at RVD. <laughs> <It was laughs> yeah. um, how about Kevin Owens? Did you get to interact with him? Um, kind of the same thing, you know, I mean, I gave him some knucks on the way out, you know, um, when we were leaving and he was busy talking to somebody and, um, um, that, that's, that's about it, you know, um, I mean, you know, Bookie Book, Booker T, um, yeah, he was and, there. And Ron Simmons and Teddy, uh, we were all in one legends dressing room, just us brothers and uh brothers, brothers. and uh vicky and the other one yeah uh, you didn't know yeah so nice. that's cool nice I mean, he's good in any hood we all know that that's right you you're you assimilate you definitely assimilate <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah but i even i didn't stay in the room that much though but i you know probably saw those guys uh more did a uh, did some interviews for some I don't know if it's going to be a DVD or if it's going to be uh, actually, I think it might be a Netflix kind of um, um, release. I'm not really sure, but oh, cool. Yeah, we all did. You know, we all took turns like going back and doing some uh, interviews and stuff. So that was cool. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah, I figured that it seems like when they bring the legends in and stuff like that, they, they gave them, hey, can you do some extra content that we're going to put later on on the network or whatever it may be? Yeah. Absolutely. Smurfly. Yep. Yes. How about uh, Triple H? Did you get to fist bump him or anything? I did. I did. Yeah, he's he he was really cool, um, in a good mood, and um, I got good vibes off him as well. Yeah, he's. I mean, I think yeah, watching the product week in and week out, he's just doing a really really nice job with how it's been delivered and executed. And there's a lot of thought process that goes in. You can tell, and see, he's on the ball with stuff. It seems. Yeah, you know, j just the one match that I saw in the in the front row there of uh, Randy. And well, the six man, yep, um, into a tag match, <laughs> not a six man, but actually a four man with let's call it a five man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, just the style and everything was so different than what I see on AEW, and and that was, um, it was in a way that's refreshing to make me realize how out of touch with a uh, product I am uh, because like, I didn't realize, you know, like um, um, a lot of the things that people have been telling me, you know, are, 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 you know, like uh, are in effect. And like, in some ways I think that they are, um, um, I don't want to say, I don't know, bringing it back maybe to more, you know, storytelling and simplifying the actual, um, the actual exhibition to be just doing the moves to further the story. That's the best way I can explain it, as opposed to every match having six tables broke and every wrestler diving out on the six guys. And there was just so much that was different. But again, that that was just off of one match. But um, in, in my head, though, you know, with what I have to work with, I'm pretty impressed with uh, the difference uh, of them. And I'm definitely going to be uh, looking at it more on, on TV from that perspective. Yeah, well, I think that that's a good uh, litmus test, I think, because yeah, to what you're saying, I, you nailed it. Because what Triple H and WWE has been doing is kind of like simplifying everything from the in-ring action. Like you're getting a lot of good action and a lot of great athleticism and stuff like that. But the primary focus is the storytelling and what weaves in and out of the match. And then later on, what you get into the show too. It's uh, and that's both on SmackDown and on Raw. It's like I was telling one of my buddies that I do another show with how I think this is the best summer WWE has had in a long time. Like from a storytelling standpoint, because they've been doing a very nice job.
from houses too, right? I yeah, mean, oh, from house, yeah, from selling tickets and all that stuff, the live right. event stuff. And did you hear though that I think starting next year that they're going to reduce the shows, the live shows, down to two hundred, two hundred a year instead? And I didn't, I didn't know that they were doing that many now because uh, I saw somewhere a quote where I believe it was uh, Triple H that said that they weren't actually, maybe I <laughs> actually, I know where I got the quote from. I heard him say it <laughs> now that I remember um, saying to the wrestlers um, something about that they don't do uh, nearly as much travel as they used to. Mm -hmm. And maybe he was talking about coming up 2025 if they're doing that now i i don't know he wasn't talking to me but i you know um i came into the arena at one time and sat down for a few minutes and um was trying to pay attention to a meeting and then um that was part of it yeah but anyway what i got out of that though was yeah we were doing four house shows every week and two tvs not everyone was on both tvs but it seems like i always was and then sometimes a pay-per-view too and then sometimes international which takes place of any days off and um anyway it was a lot it was it was really a lot and that's one of the things that i've heard people say is that they are better at understanding if people want time off, which I don't know that that would necessarily reflect the time on changing or not, but I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah. No, because that has to be such a different kind of environment because you are so used to that hectic, wild schedule where it's so, like, overwhelming. And now, if it, like, they're cutting it down, I mean, that's a lot more favorable to the, the talent in certain ways. But it's also, like... Do you think that can be also detrimental in a certain way because you're not wrestling as much? Is there a balance to that? Not unless, not unless they're only doing it like uh, once every three weeks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense then. And if they're making uh, most of their business off of TV and not at, at the actual live events, then, you know, there's not as much incentive to even – to even do them, you know, I, I, I could see it maybe becoming just a television uh, product if that's the way that the, that the money flowed, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, what's up, gang? You guys want some five-star cleaning on your grooming habits? Well, you know a wrestling podcast is not a wrestling podcast without a sponsor like Manscaped. I got the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra, and dang, it is cool. Such a neat presentation here. And I am excited to try it. As you know, I'm Italian, a little swarthy, have a lot of body hair going on. And, you know, something like this, the lawnmower will do perfect, will do wonders for me. Check this out. Look at all you get with that. You get the, the different blade heads, and you get the, the razor here and stuff like that. And then there's a lot of cool other toiletries and accessories in here as well to help you out. So you get your plugs and everything. But easy to travel with, everything like that. And lawnmower, not only do you, can you get that, but you can get the dome shaver now too. I just turned it on. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. It is ready to go right out of the box even. Look at this baby. Boom. So you can go to, let, let, got the light. Man, I'm learning everything about this. Got the light and everything. So check it out. What you can do is go to manscaped.com, use promo code RVD and get 20% off plus free shipping. You can get the lawnmower. You can get the dome shaver. You can get, heck, you can get the weed whacker, which I use for my nose. I got it up in my bathroom over there. So you got plenty that you can choose from here with Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com. Use promo code RVD. Get 20% off and feel clean, look good, feel good, and look five-star, baby. Did any young talent come and approach you or anything like that? Introduce themselves? Yeah, yeah, sure. They did. Absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, that was very respectful. Uh in that manner as well um a lot of people thanking me for being there and um telling me how much they appreciate me and putting over the podcast as well oh yeah. really they said some stuff uh, yeah yeah some uh some wrestlers did and uh and the fans sitting right be behind me which I, they're probably watching here and i hey. saw i saw his comment on twitter he said dude i was um, I was right behind you, um, and SmackDown, thanks for being so cool. But that was one of the things they said behind me. I, dude, I love your podcast, man. I really appreciate what you do. Something like that. Dude, that's awesome. Paraphrasing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah, hearing the wrestlers too, um, somebody specifically saying they appreciate me, uh, you know, kicking them some some knowledge, you know, and that's that's different than just saying I enjoy your podcast because because then I, I I I you know can come up with uh, some kind of idea of what they get out of it, and you know that um, has to go in power with what I want people to get out of it. Otherwise, you know, we're not we're we're imbalanced so so it's always good to hear that you know i just like i said before you know i'm not i i don't look at myself as being um any better than everybody else and i get tired of hearing me giving advice it, to me it sounds you know sometimes i just get tired of hearing myself talk like a like a know-it-all and if i make like one mistake uh, one mistake, you know, like, oh, I said in that interview that the, the McGuire, the like, the, uh, the mayor LaGuardia commission came out in 19, you know, 43 and it was 44. Oh my God. Someone's going to look that up and say, look at him spitting out bullshit. You know, like I, I torture myself in my head in ways that you wouldn't, you wouldn't even know about, but I can't, that's not a part of me that I try to share what you get on the podcast is like, uh, and like an in between, you know. I mean, obviously, I got an image I still got to uphold. So, um, but I appreciate the fact that as open and sharing as I am, that it connects me to more people that uh, can relate and then can hopefully learn from some of my experience or my perspective can at least in some way, um, you know, help them out. So that's always awesome. Well, the neat thing too about it is that like if wrestlers are giving you that type of feedback, you, they're getting bu double kind of advice because you're helping them out from a wrestling perspective in certain ways a lot of the time when you talk but then they get the added element of the rvdology and how you view things from a different perspective it's just like hey uh, i'm getting a double bonus here kind of thing so that's kind of if they all understand my wrestling is porn um rant if you want to call it that it will change the business and that's that's like one of the things that bothers me so much and, and when i say they're not committed that's what i mean is that you know they just just stopping what they're doing uh everybody sees it just like uh, seeing the shadow of the director trying to come in on a <laughs> you know, you know, think, if they think of it that way then, then hopefully they can stay committed the whole time because like uh you know when i got trained by sabu like way back in 89 90 um something that uh that made us way better than a lot of the other local green independent wrestlers from other other camps or whatever you want to call it you know he said you know everyone like they uh they just stopped like he said like when i he goes uh, and he came at me you know and choked me you know and um and, and you know I, I i think i grabbed his wrist or something and and he said um you know like this was a day of a job or two mostly they would just go ah! And maybe not even grab the wrist, but you know, he, Sabu was like, "Try to get out, you know, like wiggle your elbows around. That's you know, that's we can still make movement, you know, and try to push him back or whatever. Don't just stay there and let him choke you." And and that just that's the way that I got trained, and that's what sunk in. And, and he was like, always the whole time, from when you walk out, and she obviously said this too, from when you walk out through the curtain till when you walk back, and your mind, you gotta imagine that all eyes are on you even if you're in a battle royal or whatever you got to be consistent if you know if you want to be one of the best but but um but that's what he said he didn't say if you want to be the best he said you gotta do that and i agree with him but i don't like telling people you gotta do that but if you don't you know if you don't want to uh um annoy me and um other and you know if you want to stand out uh it, it's that's that's one of the one of the top two or three things in my mind that would change the business it seems to be like they think okay i'm in the corner no one's looking at me uh that kind of mentality yeah yeah no it's like a completely when you made mention that and made that analogy of it all it does make a lot of sense because uh it's yeah. going to be the title of my book <laughs> wrestling is porn yeah <laughs> <laughs> wrestling you're like leaning on the words on the front of the cover yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty funny 
Uh, but no, I think that's great uh, stuff. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was neat to see you there. Uh, a lot of the fans were definitely happy to see you guys. And, um, you know, Teddy it was Long. really loud. Yeah, it was really loud. They were chatting RVD, like, as soon as I was walking, like, towards my seat, you know, and it was, like, dark, but everybody saw it anyway. And looking back at it with the bigger picture now, it seems like everybody had more of an idea of what to expect than I did because, um, you know, like, as soon as the camera guy points at me, like, everyone already knew they didn't have to wait. You know, I thought they were going to have to wait until they saw me up on the screen. Yeah. Like, oh, look, it's RVD. But they were all already, they were already all waiting for the camera guy to give his cue. And it's just like, um, you know, I, I was soaking in like all the love and stuff and, you know, ha having to do it again, you know, I would have maybe found out how long is the camera going to be on me or, you know, but um, one, I don't, I'm, I'm, not one to ask questions. I've always wanted to just play off of the, the moment. And I and that moment, you know, felt right. But um but also I did try to ask him, but it came out as in like um how long will I have? And I knew he meant before he comes on and I couldn't fix that in time because I only had like two seconds. So I was like, never mind. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. It was cool. It was awesome. You know, um obviously uh it was loud, but obviously um, people are still behind me. So that's awesome. You know, lots of love and a, what a huge crowd filled all the way up to the ceiling. So uh, I really felt a lot of energy in there. It's been a minute since I felt that much energy. How about that, huh? Man. Yeah. Well, it was pretty neat because I remember um, Philadelphia during the Hall of Fame, you and Katie came out. And even I think before even the cameras were rolling, the crowd was already going RBD or yeah. because they would see it down there. <laughs> Just, yeah. 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 Pretty nice. Um, I think, I think that fans understand the production more now, pay more attention to that. Uh, and, and something else that, um, that, that I, I think really stood out from my experience was, so, you know, not, not being around the, those shows, that much mm -hmm. and, like, and like watching it weekly with a bunch of dudes eating chips and you know whatever it is they do <laughs> <laughs> just getting a lot of feedback from social media or whatever is it, it, it's not only is it toxic but it's also deceiving because every everybody there they were there to have fun right it was so obvious. It was again. It, I'm going to use the word refreshing. It was so refreshing because everyone was. They were. They were. They were all right on cue as if they were part of the show throughout the whole thing. That's how I saw them reacting to the spots in a way that was fun and you know not uh, not like the criticism and the insults and the stuff that, that you, you can read online and everyone's a critic and everyone thinks they, they would be better at running a multi-million dollar company, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was a big strong takeaway too. It was like, wow, everyone here is just happy. They're loving the show. They're so glad to be here. And, uh, and, and I get it. It's a very fun vibe. It's so funny you say that. Seriously, just this morning, so I, I know another writer. He took his mom to the TNA show uh, this past weekend. Victory Road, it was called. So it was in San Antonio or Houston or something like that. But either way, he was saying, he went and commented on it. He's like, dude, it is such a different vibe when you go to a show live in comparison to being online. He said that exact same thing. And like I was like, he's so right because everybody's there to have fun. And yeah. it's not... You're not trapped. Like, you don't get the toxic people that are just trolling or saying stuff to say stuff, and they don't have a picture of themselves or whatever. It's it complete. People are there for the reason to have fun and enjoy themselves. And it, that's neat that, uh, you know, when you go to a live wrestling show, it's a good time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. So that's definitely uh, uh, also to put in perspective all those thousands and thousands of people they're not on twitter afterwards leaving comments and stuff you know like the the actual uh smart fans if you want to use that word and i think that'll translate to you know what i'm talking about people that think they know everything that's going on and in, in the real life of people and all that 
um, those people are really a smaller percentage of the mainstream. And uh, sometimes you need a reminder of that, too. Absolutely. Because, yeah, if you're so many of our eyes, and especially if you're a celebrity and stuff like that, a lot of the eyes are on social media, and that's how you get some feedback and stuff like that. But it's also just a small microcosm of people in general. Like, I think Twitter, I once heard, is like only like 10% of the population or something, if that. And I like, believe it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, and will, would that be a national population? or? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure about that. I want to say, I would believe it's just national, because it would be, I would think it would be much, much smaller if it was the world, right? I guess well, I imagine that. Y yeah. I'm with I you would there. think it would be there, yeah. And I think I would see a lot more uh, Hebrew um, messages and stuff like that on my on my <laughs> on my, on my uh, feed. Sometimes there's you know Japanese on there. Yeah, you get a lot of different. Uh, yeah, different but I think I'd have a lot more. No, um, yeah. I mean, we probably probably said enough about that. But it's it's like um, sometimes you you get like that's your world. It's like everyone on the internet already knows, you know. But that still doesn't mean that everybody in in the real wrestling world even uh even has a clue and sometimes it's, it's easy to lose perspective of that you know like sometimes uh the administration in wwe would seem like they were too busy to even be keeping up with some of the other indie shows or whatever at one one time right and, and i kind of thought like Phew, how can that be? You know, these guys are like the most over guys on the indie scene. Like they got to be studying. That was my my mindset at the time. When, and I can't even remember the exact situation, but I, I, I thought at the time, like, like that's probably bullshit. But, um, but then after being in that machine, I see how it would be hard sometimes to uh, – for a lot of stuff to penetrate through that machine. You really would have to send feelers out and, and be an octopus to extend your tentacles in every direction outside of your the bubble that you have to be in in order to keep everything running and be successful. Right, right. I, from a, the perspective of if you're running a company like WWE or AEW or something like that, if you get, I mean, obviously they use, I think, you know, obviously, social media becomes a factor in maybe what getting some feedback. How would you take it if you were running a company? Would you heed a lot of what you hear on social media if that's like a big outpour? Like, say somebody wants a talent, like uh, Ricky from Seattle, that wrestler, that he's getting a lot of traction after SmackDown, you know, <laughs> after he showed up. Would you be like, hey, we should maybe use him again? Like, it, just specifically off of social media. I'm not saying. Would that be something you would consider if you run a company? Does that make sense? Definitely uh, would be worth considering for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the choice I would make on it, I, I don't know, I can't say, but it, it would be everything's worth considering. And, you know, a company that big, you, got, you should have, and I think they do have like a whole – matter of fact, I know – well, he might work for TKO, but I'm sure they have a social media – marketing team anyway and um, their job should be part of that you know and why not um you know raise water everywhere a high tide raises all ships yeah, so you know cool. yeah yeah even if it's something that's not that important you don't want to focus on that it's still something to consider you know and maybe take it into account and uh maybe consider the voting power of that perspective limited if that's what you think it is but it definitely has some value Absolutely, yeah. I think it's something you take from and see what else, uh, the different analytics from what people are watching on TV or what you do here from live events or anything like that. It's all, it all comes in the combination. And W's got such a huge company that they would probably be doing that. Anyway. Um, before I move on from SmackDown, did you happen to see Andrade did a spit-legged moonsault? Nah, I missed it. I didn't know that. No. All right. I saw that and I was like, I wonder if he was doing that. Because uh, RBD was sitting there, but I don't think he, he was sitting there at the time. Does he not usually do that though? I don't know. I haven't watched his matches steady enough to see if that's a common thing he does. But I was like, it made it stand out that night. I know that much. <laughs> Maybe they can tell us in the comments. Yeah. D does Andrade usually do that, guys? Let us know if he does usually do a split legged mood salt. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex, guys. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get the extra confidence in bed. Listen up. BlueChew.com. 
Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Mm. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you receive prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online, so no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in the line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. They always say first impressions are important. What about lasting impressions? Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code RVD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code RVD to receive your first month free. Visit Blue Chew for more details and important safety information. And we, RVD and I, thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. So a tribute. Yeah, yeah. might have been a little hat tip to the R V D there. <laughs> um so guys, yeah, feel free to ask a question. Our super chats are down currently, but feel free to use the questions and I'll ca- keep my eyes peeled on them. So we got a couple here. Frankie from last week. He asked some good ones last week. Let's see what he's got this week. Which is more so about ECW's greatness? Paul's genius or letting guys be themselves? What was the journey? Okay, and the second question, what was the journey from WCW to All Japan? Let's start with the first one, Rob. Which is more so about ECW's greatness, Paul's genius or letting them guy, letting guys be themselves? Um, I think it was, I would say, Paul's genius because a lot of us didn't know what our strengths and weaknesses were without him pointing that out to us. It wasn't like it's often uh, reputed as being where um, everyone just had a free for all to do whatever they wanted because um, not only you got to have some kind of structure, but I mean, um, not everyone is going to be that that talented and and uh i mean you know you'd have people saying well hey i want to be on for 45 minutes how come steve crano and tommy dreamer get to be on for 45 minutes and i'm only on for 15 that's not fair and you know but paul would uh help us realize our strengths and our and our weaknesses he would guide us he was good at showcasing that and um bringing the the best out of all of us so um, it was it was the captain leading the ship for sure. And the thing was, is like Paul was so good at knowing, you know, you're letting you guys be yourselves in a lot of ways and knowing where the, the strengths of you guys came into play and how to prop that up in a little bit more and, and make it edgy too in the same turn of it. So good stuff, good stuff, good well, question. Paul has also had some uh, clients that uh, – Probably the worst thing he could do is let them be themselves, and they kind of need, need to be tamed. <laughs> and um, I'm going to be bad at that, but he's good at that, too, and not letting them be themselves. It's <laughs> a good point, too, Rob. <laughs> uh, and then his second question was, what was the journey from WCW to All Japan like? So I got the, the booking to go to All Japan, before I got the job with WCW. So uh, I started with WCW in December and my first trip for All Japan was gonna be in February of 93. And I knew that it might be an issue, um, but I threw it out there on the table when I got hired by Bill Watts. WCW worked with Japan but they, their partner was uh, New Japan, which was a Noki. All Japan was a giant Babasan, and they were competition. And so I knew it might be an issue. Bill Watts said, you're already obligated. You can finish out any of your obligations, um, but then that's it. You know, don't take any other bookings. So already, even way back then at uh, 22, 23 years old, I'm jumping territorial walls in a way that 
I would do pretty much throughout my whole career. And that's what I, why I became known as Mr. Monday Night for that same reason. Um, Bill Watts uh, never said anything about me going to New Japan, but I came back. It was a 15 day tour in February of 93. Mm -hmm. And uh, January, February, March, April, by May, I was done with WCW and I and I quit. So I don't know. Um, I don't know if I would have went for New Japan eventually, which I have now, but it was after I became a much bigger star more recently. Um, and at the time, um, I knew that I got over with uh, Giant Baba and and I I could go back there and wrestle for way more money than I was making at WCW. That was one of the reasons that I walked, that I quit with WCW. Um, it was all about the money. One of the reasons was because I was getting paid a lot more from uh, All Japan and also because I was getting a lot more just on the independent scene uh, when I could control my merchandise and, and all kinds of stuff. So. Um, it, it was all money, and also at the end there, when uh, Ole Anderson took over, they weren't doing anything with me except for beating me up. So, um, boom, you know, thanks. See you later. Bye bye. <laughs> um, and uh, that was that was it. I went to when I did my first tour in all Japan. Um, I knew I'd be coming back and doing WCW because I had signed a contract with them uh, about two months before the actual all japan date but um it was danny crawford specifically that would pull me aside and say hey kid this is how he said he said kid if you ever ever bring this up i'm going to totally deny it but you have a job here if you want it you can call your shots they baba loves you he told me that on the first tour like when we were in osaka yeah and i'm like man he would deny it like you wouldn't back me up bro <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't say that <laughs> <laughs> but also he you know he helped he yeah he had a lot to do with um helping me feel confident and and also understand the situation there because i didn't know that you know and then uh he was always saying, "Oh, I gotta put you with my with my cousin." He was talking about uh, Mike Lazansky. He always wanted to put us together. Uh, good looking kid, just like you. That's my French <laughs> name. My like girl accent. Um, anyway, he eventually did do that, and we tagged a couple times, you know. But um, not for most of my old Japan career, though. And then I had that awesome match with Phil, um, Phil Lafon, Danny Crawford, same guy. In, uh, in in Tokyo with the Budokan, that was my first singles match in the Budokan, and I'd been going touring with All Japan for two or three years at that point. If it's '95, then I guess well either way, because it was anyway <laughs> two or three years at that point, and uh, that was a really big uh, pivotal point for me. That was like one of those matches that really helped elevate me. I learned a lot working with him like in in the ring learning you know like he he the way that he would uh pause or react or his timing the way that it, he the way that he was connected to the crowd like i don't remember paying enough attention to the crowd before that but the way we had that match and then the way that uh he made everything mean something and the, and, and and i understood that you know so he gave me some gifts that I carried on for the rest of my career. How often did you work with Danny? Was that like overseas there? Was that quite a bit, but it was usually tag matches. Him and Doug Furness were uh, the, the tag team. And so a lot of times it would be uh, me and whoever, you know, I mean, uh, me, I, me and Michael Zansky did it. Me and Bobby Bradley did it. Uh, so a lot of matches would be six man tag matches, you know. It was it was always it always seemed really random. Like the whole throughout my whole time with All Japan, uh, it was never like about storylines. It was all more about the athleticism and the matches, and then that built the storylines because, you know, if you saw Kabashi and Masawa really tear it up. 
fuck yeah, you're going to watch the rematch. You know, it, it was about that. There wasn't like skits and stuff. Sometimes they would film the post celebration when they're pouring champagne over their head in the back and they might scream a couple things at the camera. That was about it. You know, the whole company wasn't about that. That's another reason I had no experience talking on camera until I got to ECW. Wow. Yeah. That's a little amazing. experience. I don't want to. I want to knock NWC and South Atlantic and IWF and, but but you know what I mean though. I wasn't comfortable with it. Yeah. Okay. This is gonna sound like a novice, dumb question, but uh, love- when you were <laughs> when you were you were making good money in all Japan, uh, what really prompted you then to just go to ECW, or what prompted you to not stick with all Japan? Well. So I didn't, uh, I was able to do both. I didn't leave all Japan for ECW. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was able to do both. In fact, the reason that, um, I actually turned Paul down the first time that he called and, um, and I didn't like the offer that he threw out on the table. And I knew that I was making a lot of money for all Japan. And so, um, he, he was, I felt like he was only calling me as a favor to Sabu because Sabu kept saying, and Sabu was there already, and I'm wrestling for all Japan and doing some indies. So this was kind of just like another indie, except these guys have TV. They're actually doing something, you know, but it wasn't a lot different than if I would have worked for Joe Civoldi's IWCA or, or whatever, you know, or, um, except it's TV. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, I didn't know that much about it until Sabu was already there trying to tell me about it. Um, and he, you know, he'd been working with the, the area and the tri state wrestling maybe since 93. Like, like he was always talking about how things are different there and, and, um, and how he was getting over there. I remember talking about Kevin Sullivan and, uh, that, that, um, Joel Goodhart, I believe is the guy's name. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah, and he was always talking about bringing me up there, and I think it was like '93 because I remember first I was so green hearing him talk about this, this, you know, this place that's really cool to go work for. And anyway, um, in '95, he started. Uh, Sebu started saying, um, "Hey, did uh, did Paul call you this week?" And I said, "Paul who? Paul Heyman? Did he? He didn't call you? No, he didn't call me that." Damn it. He said he was going to call you. And he go, hold on, I'll call you back. And he'd hang up. And that would happen like every few weeks. And, uh, you know, what, 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 I, I told him to call you. He needs to bring you in. You know, you'll get over big here. And um, he just needs to see you. Uh, damn it. Let me see. He, he said he was going to call you. And anyway, I really didn't care if he called or not. Yeah, um, and then when he did call, I don't know why. I mean, you know, it seems like I would have been excited to be on TV and stuff. But, but I just remember it was like, well, if he calls, it calls. If not, you know, then he doesn't. And then, um, and, and Baba was telling me at the same time to choose my calendar. That's yeah. the best way to put it. You know, they did uh, at least five tours. I think they did more than that. Um, I can't remember how many tours a year all Japan would do, but they said, he said for me, um, at this point, cause he was good at, you know, giving me a raise, uh, gave me another raise, um, must've been three raises unless one was a big jump up, but, um, he eventually, you know, it, sometime in there, he said, you know, uh, you, you come back to me with the dates that uh, you want to work, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to have you over here, but they knew that. I didn't love being in, in Japan. You know, it was hard for me being young and green and stupid. Um, you know, I didn't like seafood and it was just really long tours. And like I've said in some of my stories, I was such an introvert and so shy that I didn't like really even fit in on the bus load of all these big monsters that have these war stories, you know, about traveling around the world and having each other's backs and bars and shit like that. If you haven't heard, uh, I got comfortable finally when I got to hook up with the, the hoods because they would have hash. And, and you know, that was like my escape. I would smoke hash, which is a, a product of marijuana, let's say. Um, it's in that family. And, and anyway, um, Doc, um, who was um, Steve Williams, uh, actually thought that I was, uh, and I'm, I don't mean to say this 
you know, I, so let's say slow, you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, he thought that I was a little bit retarded, I think, or autistic, something to that extent, because we were all in the room and, and I wasn't really talking much. And they're like, remember that time in Russia when those mobsters broke in and we had to, you know, I mean, I'm just like, um, I was in the high school band last year. That's what I felt like. And, you know, I, I didn't really enjoy it. I loved the matches. I loved getting over. I loved the money. But that was it. I was, you know, didn't eat <laughs> when I was over there um, for the first several years. And uh, anyway, um, they said, you tell us when you want to come over, when you want to be booked. Because they had regular tours every year. It was like a 15-day tour in February. So I always loved that. It was the shortest one. Mm -hmm. The longest one was in November. That was the tag team tournament. That was five weeks. And so, you know, they did regularly. And anyway... Paul wanted me to go up there and work with Mikey Rip Wreck and get Mikey over. And so I was like, no, because of the money as well. But also, I'm not going to come in there and, and uh, you know, put this guy over. What are you talking about? And anyway, um, Sabu's like, did he call? I'm like, yeah, he called. I told him, fuck off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what? He goes, you wanted to do what? He said, oh, damn it, uh, he will, he'll call, I promise, he's going to call you next week, whatever. And, and then when Paul ended up calling back and then brought me in under different terms, and um, I still wrestled for All Japan, though. So um, I started in January of 96 with ECW, but I still wrestled for All Japan until 99 when Giant Baba passed away and, and i've often said 97 myself in interviews but i've realized and fixed that in my mind it was actually 99 when he passed away and then i did one tour for mrs baba which a lot of the boys didn't get along with mrs baba that's why they left with misawa and started noah because uh they were there out of respect for Mr. Baba when he passed away. They didn't get along with Mrs. Baba, so they ran Noah to compete against. And it was Misawa was the head of it, and a bunch of a bunch of guys left with him. And that's the history of Noah and all Japan and RVD. Wow, how about that, man? Okay, so that makes sense. So once once you started making more good money, and they were getting you over in ECW, you were like, okay, I can kind of taper a little bit of my dates with all Japan and focus more so plus the aspect of you not loving being in japan all the time was another added element for you to just kind of be like hey, yeah i'm committing more to ecw now and ecw was fine with me doing trips to japan too they didn't care you know cool. sometimes i would miss some dates and um you know they weren't gonna they weren't gonna try to compete with it yeah yeah absence makes the heart grow fonder too <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah um, I mean, that's something that we always thought was the more exposure you get the more you help the whole product right yeah right uh-huh that's you how it's always felt unless you do something that, that, that downgrades it right right yes yeah. rvd's possible. worldwide you're worldwide man um how validating did that feel too when danny crawford told you that baba would love to use you anytime you wanted to did that feel pretty good being a young star and be like holy shit but like if baba likes me i know i'm doing something right yeah yeah i really did you know, I, I, I got Danny's number like a year or two ago from somebody, and I, I don't know if I've called him. I haven't talked to him. If I did call him, I didn't get an answer, but I don't even think I've called yet. And I was just thinking about that earlier today, synchronicity, um, thinking, you know, about actually calling him. And uh, it'd be good to talk to him because he probably doesn't know. He probably doesn't know that I give a shit. He helped me out a lot. And um, it wasn't like he and I were like best friends or, or anything, you know what I mean? Like, he always treated me like I was a kid and like he was a veteran, but he just really like did a lot. Uh, he was always entertaining too. You know, he liked, uh, <laughs> he made me laugh a lot too. Like some of this, some of the jokes that, that he's done um, in the dressing room that I've heard, I heard, actually I heard Pat Patterson say this uh, same joke, the gender changed, but uh, this was, uh, oh my God, I couldn't sleep last night. Oh, Danny, Danny, oh, I had this chick banging on my door all night. Wouldn't stop. Bang, 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 bang. I'm trying to go to sleep. Bang, 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 bang. Finally, I got up. I let her out. <laughs> okay. uh, another one. He used to always 
when he would like take, start to get dressed in the dressing room, he drops his shorts down. And when he's sitting there, and he go, "Oh, okay, guys, who's shit in my drawers?" <laughs> 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 Uh, and, what, and, and what really made me laugh, uh, <laughs> and and I took this from him like too much, you know. It was like something I ran with too much because I was just young and stupid, and uh, some people I was with didn't appreciate it at all. But when we'd be at a restaurant, um, usually they wouldn't speak any English, you know, depending on where you're at. So we're in a diner, and the waitress comes over, and she's like, "Oh, you see me say, oh, when you got too much, you know," and and then um. Phil would like point at the menu, uh, Danny. Yeah. Like, um, yes, uh, did, did you douche today? Did you douche today? Oh, I wasn't sure because of the smell. Okay, uh, you oh know, and they would just they cocked their head like a dog. Like, yeah, what are you saying? I don't know what you're saying. Had me rolling as a fucking you know twenty two year old. Twenty two year old, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, he did it. He he taught me a lot too, though, about wrestling, and and he was he was really 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 good. You know, it was like he he taught me that it wasn't America that had the best wrestlers. It was just they had the most uh, fame with what was then, you know, like the WWF, and it was like they had the characters that they were pushing back then. Danny used to talk about. Do you see this? There's you see what Matt Bourne's doing? He's a clown. Doing the clown now. <laughs> He says, oh, my God, when someone asks me what I do now, I tell them I'm a car salesman. Uh, <laughs> That's so wrong, <well>, man. <laughs> Abby, I do the butcher used to call him um, uh, uh, the master. The master. What, what are you doing today, master? Or no, I think the master, uh, professor, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not really sure about that now that I think about it. I think it was the master, but something that implied that he was the best at um, – at, at, at what he does because his inter his matches were always like really entertaining and when he felt like being funny out in the ring and making the crowd laugh and stuff he would but he obviously could go real hard and uh damn man they don't make him like that anymore man you're telling listen i when you're talking about danny crawford i first heard about him when i was reading uh either bret hart's biography or another book about calgary wrestling and he i i'm gonna say this i don't know if it's right or not but I think he was in the first ever ladder match in Stampede. I think he was. I don't know about that. Pretty but... neat. But I know he was kind of yeah. like, I think he was, if I remember correctly, kind of like their intercontinental champion and just really, really good at, you know, obviously, as you're saying. So, uh, yeah. He had a good look, too. I liked his look, too. Um, cool stuff. Yeah, that's great stuff. Oh, man. Yeah, I love hearing about those guys that you don't really, that don't really get a lot of credit but uh, they definitely right. Uh, yeah, it, it was crazy to see like these these. I love the style. Everything I said about I didn't like about being in Japan, but I did love the wrestling style. Yeah, that that, that was you know the business. You know, I liked the money. I liked uh, the crowds. I liked the wrestling style. I went for several years until I finally learned to appreciate everything about it. You know what I mean? Like um, it was it was. Like eventually, it was Sabu when our paths crossed in Japan. He taught me that it was okay to spend a little money to go and eat really good. And then after that, we ate Yakuniku all the time. And all of a sudden, uh, Japanese girls were super hot to me. And for some reason, when I was 22, I was just so young and stupid. I was like, oh my God, they all look the same. Like, where's some blonde hair, or some red hair, or something? And it was just, there was a lot of, uh, um, fishiness that just turned me off about Japan. Um, but I love the style always. Yeah. So I just want to say that. That's awesome. On my bucket list to go sometime. Um, let's see. Oh, Maddie just chimes in. How effing cool was it seeing RVD at SmackDown? It was effing cool, Maddie. Hey. Effing cool. You're that effing cool, awesome. Maddie. He's a huge oh. fan, Maddie is. So shout out to him. We had another super chat, Jim, Jim D. Gave us 10 bucks. Thank you, Jim. If you have a question, you can ask it. Ask away, man. I'll, I'll keep my peepers peeled here. Uh, we have some interesting ones this week, though, Rob. I'll uh, hit a couple of them here. Uh, here's a good one. Let's see if I can find it here. Oh, here it is. The Ragu Overlord. Oh, how about that? The Ragu Overlord. I'm trying to learn how to do a backflip. Any advice? Sure, I would say practice on a diving board. Mm. 
and it's all about all you gotta do is make it halfway and then you can see where to put your feet that uh that's what makes a backflip so much easier than a front flip because you make it halfway and you, your eyes you can't actually see the ground then all you gotta do is put your feet down when you do a front flip it's blind you tuck and then when you let out and if your timing's off and you let go a little too late, you end up on your stomach. If you let go a little too early, you might land on your heels and then fall on your ass. And, and, and it really has to do with just experience. It's not as easy as a backflip. A backflip, get halfway, and then you're like, oh, cool. I can just set my feet down. And uh, I would say practice on the diving board. And then, uh, you know, if you got a ring, do it in the ring if you have a trampoline that's cool too something safe like that yeah good advice man that's interesting so doing like a 450 splash is tougher than doing a, a moonsault oh yeah okay yeah okay cool interesting um you can tell i'm athletic uh let's see here yeah it's just blind it's like it's like when you open up you can't like see down ahead of your feet yeah, you're flipping forward, but you totally see it like early on doing a backflip, like halfway through. You're like, I already got this. Yeah. yeah, man. How about that? All right. Peggy Hoster. Thank you, Peggy. My now so-called friend stole some of my first package I purchased from RVD. And eight months later, she gave it back and she didn't even use any of it. Package <laughs> <laughs> I purchased from RVD. What the heck? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, some CBD cream or something. Yeah, uh, maybe. You know, maybe. Help a uh, lot of with that. Uh... Um, let's see here. King Knowles to twenty one twelve. He just a comment. Rob, I've been showing my friend wrestling, and he says you're one of his faves. So there you go. Awesome. Awesome. Very awesome. cool. Tell him I appreciate it. I'll see him in Des Moines next week. That's right. Here, let's pop that up real quick. Boom, hey. guys, he's got a new date. If you're in Iowa, go to Des Moines, the Iowa Event Center, Sunday, September 22nd, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Rob Van Dam, the 2021 WWE Hall of Famer, will be in attendance. You can get a picture, an autograph. You can scan that QR code and go right to it and get your tickets there. Go see RVD, September 22nd. Cool. One week from today, Mr. Domino. How's about that? Man, yeah. seven days. You guys got seven days. Check it out. Um, while we're plugging stuff, let's. Uh, I'll give a little shout out to the Manscaped. I got it right here. This is the. Oh my gosh, why am I blanking on it? It's the 5.0 lawnmower. That's what it is. 5.0 Ultra lawnmower, and you can shave your your gonads or whatever you want to do there with it. Uh, it works very well. You got a light on here. The lights up. See it? Check it out. But you can go to Manscaped.com. Use promo code RVD. You get 20% off. And that's not just on this. That's not just on the uh, Lawnmower 5.0. You can get the Beard Hedger, which is great. You can get the Dome Shaver, which is new. The, uh, I want to get that. Um, but you can use it on any product. The Weed Whacker, which is for the nose. I love doing that stuff. So you can go to manscaped.com, use promo code RVD, get 20% off. And hey, if you want to get a little uh, tuned in, you can use Get Blitzed. Use promo code RVD, you get 15% off. It's Get Blitz Lit A Nano Infused THC Serp. It is 100% legal in all 50 states, so you don't got to worry about anything like that. It's Delta 9. Scan that QR code if you're watching, or go to get blitz.com and use promo code RVD. You get 15% off. I have the blue raspberry in my cabinet. It is very effective and it hits you very quickly. So if you're looking for something like that, Boom, do it. Shout out to Mickey Ray and Courtney for all the help there, and we appreciate their patronage. And, hey, go to try some Blue Chew, too. You can go to uh, bluechew.com, use promo code RVD, and you get your first Blue Chew free. All you do is pay 5 bucks shipping. That's it. So go and do that, too. We thank all our sponsors. Hey, we hope to get some more, too. So uh, spread the word, guys. Give us five stars wherever you see us, uh, and be sure to like the videos and all that stuff. Get the word out about this show um let's see here's another good question rob jackson little thanks for the five bucks as a kid you were one of my favorite wrestlers oh this wasn't a question never mind as a kid you were one of my favorite wrestlers thanks for everything rob so he just wanted to shout you out appreciate um, that right yeah. Up. yeah um I th oh here's a I hope, I hope i still is 
Of course. Katie uh, did an appearance at, here in Las Vegas at the uh, Tuscany um, Center or whatever the hell they call it. Yeah. 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 Um, Chris Masters was there and Greg Valentine and Devon and Maria Canellis and I'm trying to think of everyone that she said that uh, – that she, that she said hi to, but I also saw the poster, but I... There's a lot of people. Yeah, there was a lot of people there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of wrestlers there. Uh, but anyway, uh, she went by a store, one of the vendors there, Katie. Yes. <laughs> Let me say who she is. Um, and uh, this guy was like really, really cool. And um, he told her, boom, here's this. Boom, here's this. Pick a hand, I'll give you one for free. And she texted me and said, hey, dude said I can pick one for free. Which one should I get? And I said, that one. So, <laughs> boom, look what I got. Hey, look at that. Hey. Yeah. Finally. Wow. In case you don't know, uh, they don't always send them to me. You know, That's weird. It is weird. And and some they usually do, but... But um, it has been like really late, and I don't know if they're not going to send me this one or not. Usually, it's ringside products that I'll hit up on Instagram, um, and I don't even know like if they all go through them or if only some of them are ringside products. And I really don't know, but they're kind of my go-to. And they were saying that WWE should send this to me like in August. Anyway, I just got it, and uh, and now there is, of course. One newer figure that um, I saw is getting uh, released now or soon. I saw the. It's I, feel the like I, uh, signed it. I signed it at the SmackDown building. Something that had the the package. Uh, oh, here I might have the graphic here, Rob. Is it this one? Boom. Yes, sir. That's the uh, yeah. But for some reason, it's in a group of four, and I don't I don't know why. But uh, but yep, that is definitely it. And then. If you don't see the group of four, um, they might not be released that way. I kind of got the impression all four were going to be like in one box from whatever it was that I saw. I think they're separate, Rob. I think they, okay. the, the series it's is called... Set. The, yeah, it's just the set of them all together. Because yeah. the, the series is called Defining Moments. Yeah. So uh, that's... um, I remember seeing that, an early prototype of that at WrestleMania when I was there. Right. Yeah, and, uh, but yeah, I'm stoked for the Mr. Monday night. I got to get me one of those two. Yeah, um, but hopefully uh, I'll get some. Maybe I won't. Um, and wait, what else? Oh, and then there's the re-released figure that was a Walmart exclusive years ago that's now being re-released by who? Do you know? Uh, it would be by Mattel, right? Um, would they all be by Mattel? Yeah, but they're all made by Mattel. So, but how come some are Ringside products? So, Ringside collectibles, they do. I yeah. think they do exclusive. Yeah, ringside versions. products with boxing. That's where I used to get my boots from. Oh, mm. yeah. Right. Ringside collectibles is the wrestling figures. Uh, and, and, and so, oh, does that have anything to do with making the figures? They do. I think they have a relationship with both. AEW and WWE because they do have ringside. They have exclusive figures that they just sell on that website. So maybe that's an exclusive one then. I didn't even know that. If that's the case. That's cool though. Is it? Wait. Okay, no, yeah. it doesn't say. WrestlingFigures.com, guys. Yeah, I thought this was supposed to be a Walmart exclusive. That's a Walmart exclusive. I know okay. that one. That's a Walmart exclusive. Okay. Well, cool. I need the uh, November 97 uh, Tommy Dreamer match one that... Uh, that you just showed, and then also it'd be cool to get the re-released one. It's got different packaging in it, you know. But I, is that I'm, the one with you with the tiger stripes, or is this a different one? I think this. I think I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I have a shirt on. Maybe the ECW shirt. You're right. Oh, because it's that's a basic figure. I think I don't think that's an elite one. So that would be yeah. So okay, that is a re-release. I think you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Rebuy it. <laughs> Bye, yeah, Rebuy Bye, guys. every day you'll get repaid. <laughs> repaid, that's it. <laughs> make it happen, guys. Come on. Uh, let's see. I want to make sure I cover all the Quickest ones. That... Seventy-five cents I ever earned. Best, <laughs> heck yeah. <laughs> Reeling in the dough there. Let's see here. I want to make sure. Okay, here's a good one. 
Phil De, De Cesar. I'm going to go with that. Phil De, De Cesar. Hey, Rob. Have you ever practiced Wim Hall of Fame breathing exercises? Wim Hof breathing exercises or anything similar? Enjoyed your ECW WWE matches throughout Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Thanks, man. You were aware what he means by that, Rob? Uh, I'm not really sure what Will Hoff breathing um, is, Phil, but I appreciate the question. And uh, I definitely did do and still do breathing exercises. Um, I've talked about this before, actually, um, but, you know, what haven't I talked about? But, um, <laughs> you know, like where to start. So um, a lot of my training I, I just did on my own, you know, like I did the martial arts training with the different dojos, the gymnastics training. I did all myself. I never had a, a coach or, or trainer. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people ask me about, about stretching like hey do you do ddp yoga um sometimes i do it like with him but i always had like my own thing and i have my own stretch routine uh, that i picked up over the years um and it's something that i've always been important to me i started doing breathing exercises way back in sixth grade um when a teacher named uh, mr morris who was a bit of a jackass but um, he told this story about how you can stretch your lungs out and then you can hold more air and then hold your breath longer. Mm. And I was, I was really into swimming. That's what I did all summer. I was always in a swimming pool, at least from eight years old on. When my parents went to the campground, I played in the pool. You saw me jump off the diving board on the documentary. Um, and that was really cool. I mean, they made it look like I was jumping on Bam Bam with the yeah, same you guy. You turned into it? You turned yeah, into it? <laughs> that was really cool. Um, he was talking about some hillbillies that he said lived way up in the mountains. And he was saying that because the oxygen is so thick there, the air is so thick, I'm sorry, and, and that there's not as much oxygen when you breathe in. And he was saying because of that, their bodies adapt to it. And he said, those guys can hold their breath for two or three minutes. And I just remember like being, whoa, that is so cool. And he was saying that they have contests so you can hold their breath the longest. And he said, those guys just from living up there, which is true because Justin McCauley and uh, all the MMA guys would go to Big Bear up on the mountain and have a, had a place there. They would, they would train for UFC. And so uh, this, this, this appeared to be uh, true. It did. But anyway, um, not only that, but he taught us an exercise that he said that they do when they're having these contests. And what I had to do was, uh, with, was uh, pretty simple. You, you breathe in and, and you take one deep, deep, deepest breath you've ever taken in. Like you, you, you even like, I switch my posture around sometimes because my weight might be causing my ribs to, to, to limit how expanded expanded my my lungs can get sometimes you know so that was it's even takes like you know whatever it takes but, but i but I, de I breathe in really deep as much as i can and, and i usually hold it for a little bit se second you know but but you don't really have to but i like to but you let it out slow as you can you know like real slow and you do that three times and what you're doing is you're stretching your lungs out it's much like this is the way that I like to compare it. I've always thought this was a good way. Um, you grab a balloon, a brand new balloon, and it's stiff. Like it stretches a little, but it's never been stretched before, so it, it doesn't really give that much, right? Yeah. But after you go, and you blow it, and then you know, and it might it, 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 there's resistance, but once you once you get that in, if you let all the air out, and then you blow it up again, guess what? Now it's stretched out and those are that's like your um your evoli that are your sacs that hold the oxygen inside of your lungs so i always do that before um i wrestle um or before i want to hold my breath real long or once in a while i just do it just to try to get a relief of congestion from gravity that i just feel overall on me sometimes i like to sometimes that'll give me a break from that um this must have been I don't know. One time it was, it could have been any time sometime in the last 15 years or so, um, 10 years. Uh, 
but I wasn't in WWE, but I was walking through down the hallway or whatever. Could have been Hall of Fame. It could have been one of those times that I appeared there for whatever reason. But but I, I know I wasn't part of their, their crew. I was I was gone, and I walked by Randy Orton, and I saw him doing that. And I, he was going, you know, and I, and, and I was watching, and I said, hey. I said, I do that. I said, nobody else does that but me. He goes, I know. You taught me to do it. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Man. How long can you hold your breath for, Rob? I don't know. It used to be like a minute and a half. Nice. Yeah, but I had. It's been forever since I've had the desire to <laughs> to uh, test myself on that. Um, but you know, sometimes being underwater or something, it's fun to. You got to hold it to stay underwater. Um, so one thing I used to do that was really stupid when I was a kid. Tell me if you did this or anybody in the chat room. We used to breathe in and out like that, but we would do it fast. <sighs> maybe like 10 times or so. And then at first it would be a big breath and we'd like put our backs against the wall and our, and our partner in crime would press on the chest and you just hold your breath. And then when it comes out, it's like, and you just fall like a sack to the ground. <laughs> so my friend do it. And I was like, no way you guys are acting. And they said, no, we're not. I swear to God, man. Cause he, was, he like, he didn't know where he was or whatever. Come on, dude. I didn't believe it at all. So they told me to do it. And I held my breath. And, and then um, they were pressing against my chest. And they're saying, do you feel it? Do you feel it? And I, and I said, I shook my head no. And they said, oh, maybe it isn't going to work on him. As soon as they let go, I just fucking, bam. I felt what? right beside the bead ba the bean bag they had set up and hit my head on the floor. <laughs> so stupid and so dangerous. But we did that for a long time like we got so good at it we could do it to ourselves by like laying flat on a, on, i could lay back on my back on the cement like i'm laying out by the pool right yeah. but it's, just, it's like doing a nitrous oxide hit if you know what that's like yeah when you, when you after a nitrous oxide hit when your brain's kind of like it feels like it rebooted it, that's the a similar feeling and, and anyway i can do that by doing the, the breathing and then doing like half a sit-up and when and just holding it and you feel all the pressure and you flex and then you, when you go and then you go down when you let it out it like reboots your brain and it's it's so stupid did any is anybody else <laughs> well the funny thing is rob the guy who asked the question about breathing he's like yes we would pass out and okay was, good he said our chest <laughs> against the desk in school yeah he said i had to walk my friend to the nurse's office after he fell off his desk Oh my God, dude! We would do so stupid. We would do it in the pool and then drag each other, drag each other's body around while you're waking up and <laughs> on the swing set, on the slide, doing it on the slide, and then push my friend down. <laughs> it was so stupid. <laughs> I never heard of this. Oh my this. God, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's, so it's it's a thing, man. Like I say, it's just nitrous oxide is the best way to compare it, which, um, you know, as soon as I did the nitrous oxide, it went, you know, it was like a little CO2 cartridge or something. I remember uh -huh. the first time I remember doing it, it was like, I don't know. I remember them being around when I was a kid, though. But I don't know. I just remember when there was like a fish concert and all these fish fans at an ECW show at the Philly Travel Lodge, and they had, they were going around with a full ass fucking tank on wheels. Uh -huh. but they were like they took to their room and fill up balloons and you go <sighs> we were taking out the balloons and then <sighs> when you let it out your head scrambles and you're just like oh my god oh like you, you know not fall or anything but i'm sure some people do but even just a little it's just like a little thing where it's like a reboot and you're like oh my god like all of a sudden you feel like how much time has passed you know it's, it, it's not something i would recommend it's stupid but yeah, I, it's a doesn't uh, sound like on. it's beneficial. Am I the only stupid one, guys, in the comments? No, no. The, the guy who asked the question is one of the Right, you told me. Is it yeah, just me? Yeah. Is it just I'm me sure there's Paul? other people. Me and Phil, Phil Paul. You and Phil D. D Cesar. Yep. I want to see if there's somebody else that did that, too, though. Uh, I'm not seeing it yet. I'm sure somebody's done it. We were always daring each other, like, you know, do it in front of our parents or whatever, without them knowing, you know, like, oh, we're in the God. room. <laughs> stupid. How did I never hear of that? I've never heard of that, Rob. Um, maybe it was a Midwest thing. Maybe it was. <laughs> maybe maybe it was a Michigan thing. 
television or floaters or sometimes spinning. I, I, I think probably, probably that was depending on where on my brain I was getting hit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, what else could it be? But I don't know that for sure. But like a lot of times I would like when I bump, I would knock myself silly just from hitting the back of my head on the mat. Sometimes I blame my ponytail. Don't know if that was a factor or not, but I've done that more than anything. And, um, and I used to wonder like a chair shot in the front, um, a headshot, you know, like that in the back or, you know, getting thrown into the corner post head on. I wonder if that's what's causing all the different symptoms, but I was never able to, or never even thought about studying and relating the different symptoms to the different um, pieces of action. I wish I would have, because it makes sense, you know, in the front lobe, you know, that's obviously that's in charge of a lot of uh, different stuff than, uh, than, than say like the rest of your brain. Um, but um, I do have like, um, like I said, almost all of my, a lot of my peers, at least that are my generation or older, a lot of them tell me that they have uh, at least some kind of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could imagine. A lot of them mistakenly think it's CTE because they don't understand what CTE is. Um, a lot of them, you know, say they complain of just uh, headaches. Uh, sometimes, it, you know, just light sensitive is another thing that happens, you know, and uh, there's all these weird different symptoms that all go back. But yeah, uh, most of the guys my age or older tell me, that they're uh, that they're sure of it that they have some concussion damage, and um, you know most of them were probably in that lawsuit when they all got behind like one big uh, case and uh, and tried to tried to sue for it. I definitely owe everything that happened to me on me. Everything was my fault, um, and I never reported when something did happen. That's something that like now we were talking before about how like the show is changing more to um, a production where the fans are there to have fun. They know their cues. They're there to they're you know they're there for for you. And and it's and it's 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 all I think quicker um, that I, I think you know than soaking up all of the energy you know uh, maybe uh, uh, but it seems to be uh, more of everything you know, that that um, in that way that moves the story uh, forward. I think part of that new world is reporting more uh, when you're when you're hurt. Why not? You know, the day of uh, uh, if I can still work, then I'm not hurt. You know, I can still go the next day. And you know, the day of uh, having to prove that that you're tough, or even. I mean, you know, we did it for personal reasons too, because we did want to keep working. We want to sure, keep working. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I, but I think that that is more fading out for more of a professional environment, which would include not only maybe less of a rough schedule, but also taking care of injuries and uh, um, and having the newest education and uh, information on it. So um, that's all. That's all. I think part of you know. So uh, if you or someone that you know is suffering from concussion symptoms, these guys can get you help. They can hook you up with a doctor. They can put you with support groups. They can answer some questions. But it is you go to a CLF um, something.org. It's not. Is it helpline? CLF. Wait, let me take can a you look at that? I think it's helpline. Damn it. CLF. It Hold on. I think you're right, Rob. Here you go. Um, go to concussionfoundation.org and they will show you, uh, they can, you can contact the CLF helpline, which I'm trying to see if there's a certain phone number here. I think, I think CLF hotline.org was also, um, the thing that I said on my videos that they, you know, okay. but, either, but either way, you know, like that was part, that was very frustrating for me too, was, when uh, I had the double vision, it threw me so far off my game. You know, everything was way harder. And I kept thinking, you know, I'm sure it's going to go away. And it, and it just, man, it's certain patterns, checker patterns or something, you know, would like really make everything worse. I couldn't see the depth 
of anything or judge. And it was like trying to trying to find out who to go to, you know, like who do I who do I go see? What doctors? And you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned this here last week or not. I said it somewhere, so excuse me if I'm repeating myself, but I went to one doctor, an eye doctor, in, uh, an eye doctor, the kind you get glasses from, in uh, Redondo Beach, and he told me that they were crazy. There was nothing wrong with my brain. I just needed a new prescription. Oh, yeah. You, I think you said yeah. that on here. Uh, it was Yeah, I got so much um, contradicting information. Wow. It made, that made it extra, extra really rough because it was like no help, but now there is. Yeah, always feel free to get a second opinion, guys. And then, uh, yeah, it's it's nice. I mean, it's not nice that people have it, but it's nice that you can have somebody too, maybe going through the same symptoms that you are, and that it can help you out and kind of give you a different perspective on how to think about that too. If they're having like a, like Rob uses the example of double vision, so maybe somebody else has double vision and can kind of relate to what you're going through too. Yeah, the, the, the exercises were really cool, and they were always progressive, you know, just like any good therapist does, always making it each week a little bit more challenging. And, um, man, that's – I would say, but is it my – the muscles in my eye or is it in my brain, like the wiring? And uh, the neurologist would say it's, it's, it's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Jeez. Okay. Good stuff. Um, we'll do a couple more questions, and we'll close it on out, I guess. Um. Maddie has a good joke. Why should you knock on the fridge? Because there could be a salad dressing. There could be a salad. Okay. <laughs> I, I had to repeat to myself. <laughs> it yeah. took me a second when I first read it. Yeah. Wait a second. All right. Nice. Yeah. nice, Maddie. Nice. Um, yeah. Hey, Rob. John asks, what are your thoughts on Dustin Rhodes? Dustin was one of the coolest dudes that I saw Friday. You know, I've always, I mean, oh, you mean always, Cody? Do you mean? Oh Cody? yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I forgot to Cody. ask you about Cody. Go talk about Cody first. He, he was a super cool, um, really cool. You know, and me and Katie for a while hung out in front of his bus because he in the garage he had like some lawn chair, not really lawn chairs, but like fold out. Uh, chairs that you would have on the lawn or whatever yeah yeah um, sitting in front of his bus just like he was camping but it was in the garage and uh and me and katie hung out there for a while and and you know he came by uh, a few times and he was just like super cool you know and um uh even gave us a bottle of vodka which you know which um he i don't know if that's his vodka do you know it is the yes Whitley. Yeah, he boom, gave us a wrapped up bottle of vodka, and unfortunately, we're going straight to the airport. So, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, down it, he was just really cool. He was, yeah, anyway, um, Dustin is super cool too, you know. Like, I don't, I've never had any reason to not like, uh, eat either of those, like, you know, um, Goldie, we always, he's Goldie to me, you know, um. He used to enjoy making everybody laugh too, you know. And I remember one time when we were in Europe and in the morning, we all had like a nine o'clock call time or something to get on the bus. And people that are already on the bus are waiting for other people to come down and hand the guy their bags that'll put them underneath and then come up the stairs to get on the bus. And um, Dustin kept doing this thing. And he would also do it with people walking by that weren't wrestlers. That was funny too. Just people that if they happened to be uh, um, pedestrians, but he would, he would be at the top of the steps. And when somebody was coming, he would take his bottle of water and he'd put it in his mouth. And he'd go out there and like somebody would be walking and he'd like act like he was sick. And like, he's going to throw up like right in front of him. And, whoop, whoop. and you know, they'd be trying to go around him and he would, whoop. he would like go that way and that way. And then he'd go, <laughs> it would spit the water up and people would be like oh they'd be freaking out and it was just entertaining everybody on the bus um and <laughs> when i came down i no sold it and, uh, <laughs> i came down and he, <laughs> and he spit and i just you know i just looked at i just like kept on walking and like no and, and sold it got on the bus and then uh, i remember that that uh, sean stasiak said that uh and when I went by, somebody somebody just 
spoke for me and just said that I went cool. Like that was <laughs> my reaction was just looking at it cool. You know, I can't who Sean said said that, but maybe he said it. But anyway, uh, yeah, I remember him singing on the airplane ride from hell when he was singing to his um, soon to be ex. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was just the boys. I mean, that, so, I mean, it sounds weird. They would get on. It was weird, but it, but it wasn't like it was a, a public airplane and he was like asking to have her back, but it was awkward in that way though, even on our private airplane, because he was saying about wanting her back and missing her. And I think she was maybe with another dude. So that was weird. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I can't. I don't. I don't know all the details of that. But um, I thought, though, like, ouch! Like this, movie, he got some. He got some pain in his heart. Yeah, that's a tough thing. That's a that's a tough yeah. thing, especially if you're you're going through a lot of stuff and everything, you know. But um, both those guys are, are great. Like, um, but also, he didn't mind being silly and didn't mind, you know, putting himself on the spot. So it's not, you know, I don't think yeah. it, his intentions were anything more than being entertaining when he they, when he did that. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I mean, well, being a shoot, entertaining, yeah, you know. yeah, for sure. No, and want to entertain her, maybe, you know, maybe that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. but no, it's a. I got to see Cody at uh, SummerSlam, and he was doing like they had like a little kind of like charity event that people were helping out with, and then part of the thing people would buy tickets to like help pack food and stuff like that. But then they get to meet the wrestlers. That was like the perk of doing it. <laughs> and then Cody came by, and he was just being a fly on the wall and watching him interact with the fans and take pictures he took time with everybody he was so considerate of everyone and just really good in that role as like a good ambassador for the company right now so he's doing a good job one more thing i'll say about the vibe and uh it's because cody definitely you know was part of that vibe mm -hmm. in general um you know i hung out in the catering uh quite a bit saw a lot of the wrestlers and shit and in general um the boys don't look so tired anymore you know they look legitimately happy to be there happy to be part of something having fun and um you know it, it, it used to be a different kind of vibe of a long drawn out day of tired people uh, trying to get to you know to the end of the day and it, it didn't it didn't ring true to that so much this time and you know i've heard a lot of people tell me like oh you just gotta see how it's changed but i gotta say they wasn't lying it wasn't lying it wasn't lying yeah looks you can tell by a lot of the faces of people like or the wrestlers that they're are there they seem like they're always happy to be there and they always make day it's like it's a good it, you, you feel that energy rob I mean, you definitely feel it i think even as a fan so uh good stuff good stuff um well i'll i'll ask this too uh in comparison to aew uh was there stuff that you did like about aew that they did differently than what we did or how how is that balance of the because you said the locker room is pretty laid back there too for the most you part. asked but what, what is the question you said how, what else? <laughs> how is the how's the vibe in comparison with aew still has a good vibe right it's just kind of different is that kind of how you were getting because you touched upon that earlier i just wanted to follow up with it like the vibe of AEW in comparison? I would say that both dressing rooms had, and not just the dressing rooms, but, you know, that's using that term to describe um, all of the players. Yeah. But I, I would say that overall, it seemed to me like, like um, more of a happy and having fun vibe in both places, as opposed to, um, like I was saying, the the tired, long, drawn out days. You know, because and maybe you know that's maybe and probably you know it might be a, a reflection of the schedule. I really don't know how they've changed uh, if they have yet or if they're going to or or what the deal is. But I remember. You know, by the time we were at TV, we'd already um, flown somewhere Monday from home. Um, I'm sorry, Friday from home um, and landed somewhere, rented a car, maybe got a hotel or maybe straight to the arena and then back to the airport to 
turn your car in to fly again Saturday, you know what I mean? And then boom, come back. Maybe you drive, otherwise you fly again Sunday. And then uh, same thing, by the time Monday night TV comes around and you got to be in the building at noon or one, um, boom, we would, uh, if you're on the East Coast, but we would uh, come into Monday Night Raw. And man, uh, a lot of us, we were already like so tired because it could have been hundreds of miles of driving, flying always wears me out. Um, and anyway, a lot of that would lead into your the image that you're putting out there on Monday Night TV. Maybe you had a long Sunday pay-per-view too, you know, and then Tuesday SmackDown. So um just, just that that's something with wrestling though you know you get warmed up like i've always said you know i haven't had a run uh in in years where i've had a chance to warm up they're always just one offs um but when you warm up you have, you, you do get more uh used to the ring uh but also you know with those uh the house shows you usually don't have to be there till 5 or something like that as opposed to noon or or 1 so those days aren't as long um and uh what else was i gonna say um boom house shows and then tv oh i was just gonna say you know all japan was the same way because the big show not paul white <laughs> <laughs> the biggest show of the whole tour was always at the budokan yeah. in tokyo and it was always the last day of the run and i used to wonder you know like why when i'm we're, we're banged up a little bit after a few weeks you know we're all sore here and there and here and there you know uh but at the same time we were definitely the most in our groove because we we're working consistently and into it so i could see like both sides of it but that's kind of always been like something with uh with wrestling at least as far as my career goes yeah yeah no it's a such a dynamic has changed. It's cool to see that the it is an overall positive vibe on, across both major companies. Hear good things about TNA right now too, so that's that's really good to hear. So, um, yeah. Well, what's the, the most opening up a Maple Leaf Wrestling? Uh, something. Yeah, like. that's right. I saw that too. Mm -hmm. Maybe a cool. little travel up north. Hey. <laughs> Don't, Don't you know. know? You know, it's cool that uh, more more places uh, for the for the boys to work. The way Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Can't beat that. And for the fans. And for the fans, too. You know? All right. I guess that'll do it, Rob. Did you want to do uh, RVDology or? Uh, yeah, you know what? Um, I will talk about a, uh, a question. We were going to start um, answering questions from my YouTube page, which I still am. But uh, right now we got the de demonetized and trying to figure that out. And so, like, if. If YouTube Chris isn't posting stuff, I don't know if I care or not. I mean, it's cool to keep it up, but at the same time, um, dealing with some BS. Anyway, I had two questions. Do I know what the other one was? Um, mm, I guess it doesn't really matter because I don't want to talk about both of them right now. But um, so, but one of the questions, and I don't have it pulled right now, so I can't tell you who it was or, or whatever. But I think. That this is a good segue into leaving you with a little bit of perspective. Um, so the YouTube comment, it was in response to the video of uh, me and, and a Mr. Scott Norton, which has gotten uh, reposted for for uh, cheap cheap ratings uh, recently by my, <laughs> <laughs> by my YouTube uh, partners. Um, and uh, anyway, the comment to this uh, said something like, um, it said, I've heard something about, um, heard a lot of stories about almost fights, but not not many actual fights. And I was like, hmm, like a thought or something. Mm -hmm. And the way I took that, which I'm not sure exactly, but the way I took that was for the, the, the intention behind it was like, hmm, the, is, RVD can bark, but can he bite? That's oh. the way I so that's the way that I took it. And either way, even if he didn't mean that, which I feel like he did, you know, I don't remember exactly the way it was worded, but that's the way that I took it. But either way, I just thought that was worth uh, talking about because, one, it, it, it made me laugh. But, two, it also made me realize, like, 
you know, having the outlet that I have being professional wrestling and being able to uh, entertain you by being that character, which is an extension of me, uh, when I'm working, dude, I need your credibility or, or, or your beliefs in, in me. I need you to see me with credibility is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. As long as you believe that I have a chance that I could be one man gang or, or Bam Bam Bigelow or Tommy Dreamer or whatever, then boom, uh, I got your support. And that's important in the ring outside of the ring. I was thinking like, why would I care, like, really, if somebody thinks I can fight or not? And that's what I wanted to talk about because it's it's something to think about, you know? One, there's your ego. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody wants to be a pussy or, or be thought of. And you do think of it in a negative way if someone says, ah, oh, he's a wimp. But the reason that I think it's seen as, as negative is because fighting is part of nature. You know, my dogs wrestle each other all day. And kangaroos fight out in the wild, you know, and all animals do. It's instinctive. It's something. So when somebody is saying, dude, that guy can't fight, they're saying it as an insult. Um, but at the same time, unless you are promoting your brand, why would you care? Unless you're going to attack me, in which case then I want you to think I'm a great fighter and not attack me because I don't want to be attacked and I don't even want to fight unless I'm getting paid for it. You know what I mean? Right. So so when you think about it, it's really, I think, just the, the ego that cares about your image. Even girls, if you say, like, you weren't scared, like, that she was going to kick your ass. What? Her? I would kick, I would kick her ass. I, I would even girls. So it's not just a testosterone thing. It's something. Uh, it's something protective, just like how we all want to claim that we're right, and, and there's no way we could be wrong, even if we are wrong. That thing that, or even if uh, somebody says anything that's less than what we want to hear about ourselves, like if they say, "Dude, you're short." What? I'm not short. How tall are you? Like that that defensive thing that comes out and says, "Boom!" Don't let them say that. Don't let them think about you in a less than perfect image the way that you want them to see you. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it that way, it all seems like kind of unnecessary. So uh, I was thinking about it. And sure, like growing up, it's important. Um, and, and people that are that fight a lot or whatever, a lot of them care about their reputation. But you know what that is? You're building your reputation. What you're really doing in the professional world is you're pushing your brand. It's the same exact thing. Now, with my brand, I make money. When it comes down to my personal self, when I'm not wrestling, if we're just talking about uh, RVD on a day off, uh, Robert Zatkowski on a day off, and uh, and then you're um, and you want to question, you know, like. Um, uh, whether the guy, meaning me, um, can, it, it would get his ass beat or if he, or if he can fight or anything like that. Um, one, I have no control over what other people think of me anyway, um, and you really don't. But, uh, but two, I wouldn't care because my social reputation isn't as important as my brand. They're the same thing, except for a brand, I make money, reputation, nothing, nothing. What, get more challenges coming your way? That's what used to happen to the tough guys I remember in Battle Creek, like Troy Nesbitt and uh, what was that other dude from Beetle Lake? Um, anyway, these guys were always fighting, always fighting. And no, I certainly don't want to be known as one of those. Uh, that's a dangerous way to live as an adult for sure. And, um, you know, people like that got to get locked up. You can't have people out on the street that that are uh, swinging uh, every every time they get a chance left and right. And and that's true. You know, when, when it comes to deciding how you're going to behave, how you're going to respond when your ego is challenged, like uh, 
you, you grow up here don't let anybody disrespect you or your family or your mama don't ever say anything bad about the dead don't ever let anybody ever ever there's never a reason to, to put your hands on a woman um don't you get told all this stuff and as i always say when you're an adult you have to reprogram yourself you have to revisit these areas with the values that you're or, that you're going to carry as an adult, you know, for the rest of your life, they're always developing because your perspective changes and that's always going to happen. That's, that's a good thing. And it's necessary for, for balance, but, um, reprogramming is important. I don't believe in absolutes. I can't say there's never a time for this, never a time for that. I can always come up with, uh, an exception if, uh, if the conversation arises, but yeah, um, I just wanted to have the chance to talk about this from my perspective, to give you, the listeners, a chance to check yourselves. You know, some guys, like if they're, uh, say they're really small, um, they're little, and they know they would never fight, they're like, dude, I'm not a fighter, dude. There's, those are so few, at least in my world, over people that want everyone to think. At least, and and it's, it's what road rage is. When people, boom, get in a crash and they come out screaming and shit and like, what? You know, man, you better get in your car. I'm going to kick your ass. Oh, you ain't going to kick my ass. You better not put your hands on me. That's what I know. Everybody knows at that point that they're the best fighter. But really, they want the other person to know because they're screaming at them, telling them how tough they are. And really, I don't think you need to do that if you're tough. If you get in a situation, you can handle yourself, then good. Uh, good luck to you. But um, I always like to think about how much is directed uh, from the ego and if that's a good thing or not. When decisions are made from any emotion, I don't think it's a good thing. Any kind of emotion um, in particular, when, when, when it replaces logic. If you can use them both, great. Um, but that's often not the case because they often don't like to be in the same room together, emotion and logic. Um, but, uh, dude, your ego, it drives us and it takes like a mental effort to, to look at the ego and, and, and really question, you know, like what is this driving force that, that makes me uh, do this, that makes me, uh, stand up and say, "What? Well, I know I'm not the ugliest one in the room. No way. No way. Uh, there's got to be someone uglier than me here. You know, like whatever it is, like we're afraid to be less than our ego thinks of ourself. Think about that. And that's what I'm going to leave you with. Great one, Rob. Great one. Hey, yeah, that, that's I like that Scott Norton clip because you it's funny. It's a funny clip. But on top of it, it sh does show you how you de-escalated the situation, basically. Like Scott flipped up his sunglasses and you kept yeah. him on and you were just like, yeah. you were straightforward with him about all that stuff. Like, dude, that Scott, I don't know what you're talking about. You yeah. sound crazy right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The story will always say the exact same as many times as I tell it. And, um, you know, I don't want to be known for someone that goes around fighting a lot. So um, I hope that, you know, I hope that I, you know, and, and I shouldn't be because I don't, yeah. you know what I but, but I don't think that's a good uh, a good thing necessarily unless that's what you're looking for. But thank God, you know, we have outlets for it because it's dangerous um, to to be out um, in these streets and be acting that way. That's right. Hit a boxing bag or something, guys. <laughs> something, yeah. <laughs> something. <laughs> you get sued. Yes. Then you go to jail. And then you start building up a record. Right. And, yeah, and really, a lot of it is just anger taking over. And the reason you're angry is because your ego's hurt. This person doesn't know that you could kill him. That's right. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? This is one of those things that the more you can, like, really not give a fuck, uh, I think the better off that you'll be. There's a lot of things like that. And I've talked about the book, The Art, The Simple Art. I think it's called of, of not uh, giving a fuck. It's not simple. What's the adjective? I think it's just the art of not giving a fuck. Or maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, not that, yeah, yeah. But a fuck. There's an adjective in there. The subtle art of not giving yes, a fuck. Yes, that's what I think you're right. Yeah. Wrong. Yes, Mark, you're right. Mark Kerr, <laughs> the wrestler. No, Mark somebody. But anyway, Mark Manson. Mark Manson, thank you. I always 
recommend that if you haven't heard of it. There's even an audio book on, on YouTube, and he just talks about it. And he, I think he makes a lot of sense. I agree with a lot of what he says, and a lot of stuff that we let drive us crazy really it doesn't matter nearly as much as we make it out to be. And in, in, in martial arts, we use, we learn perspective by panning out, you know, and picturing uh, through meditating ourselves from a bird's eye view that just kept getting higher and higher until we're looking at the whole planet and I'm thinking, how important are my problems looking at this whole thing, you know, let alone even like just the city. But um, anyway, uh, those are some beliefs that I've, you know, pretty much um, held on to like since since I can remember. So they're uh, they're pretty sturdy, but the ego always gets out of control. You always got to check yourself. Oh, yeah, you, you, always. you have to. We're yeah, nobody's uh, a perfect master uh, of their ego, or else nothing would insult them. Nothing that shouldn't matter to them and their goal and their agenda which for a lot of people is to get over in society, you know? And, and if I didn't have a profession uh, where uh, I could differentiate and turn it on and turn it off, I believe I'd be subject to the same thing. Yeah, that's it. You know, yeah, always good to check your ego. It always is. You always be considered. Is my ego kicking? Is that what's going on? I got to be cognizant of that. I know that much. So, hey, we all do. We, all do. we learned a lot today. Breathing, learned about ego, a lot of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. Uh, cool, guys. Well, uh, if you want some more RVD stuff, be sure to go to RVD, robvandam.com. You can get his rolling papers. Boom. Look at that. Scoop up some of them. You can also go to RVD420 and get his glass, which they got some cool stuff there. Boom. 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 And then more, too. So go to RVD420 there. Greek Glass, based out of Pittsburgh. Shout out to those guys. So be sure to give them a little help. And, hey, if you want a little bit of merchandise, go to onetruesport.com. And look at that. You can get some cool RVD merch there. One of the, Somebody just bought that RVD one in the middle right there. So uh, get the word out about that. Go to onetruesport.com and scoop up your RVD shirt. And we all benefit from it because uh, a lot of the profit will go to the wrestlers themselves. So. Cool stuff, guys. Yeah, cool stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and see Rob this week, Iowa. Uh, no, next week. Idaho, not Iowa, right? Des Moines, no, it's Iowa. Oh, Iowa. I said it wrong. Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines, Idaho. Iowa. Okay, Idaho. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Starts okay, with an cool. I. <laughs> yeah. See you on the twenty uh, second of September. Yes. Thanks cool. everybody for chiming in too with your questions. And uh, appreciate everybody, their patronage and hanging out and just having a good time. So, guys. We'll All right, before, before we go, uh -huh. did you see the plastic bag on the head? Yes. Oh, the Daniel Bryan thing? The Bryan yeah. Danielson thing? Yes. I guess. I guess, yeah. Is that what it was? Was Moxley doing it to Bryan Danielson? Yes, he was. Boom. So that oh, was yeah. the end of the pay-per-view. Yeah. That was Okay. Yeah, let's get your thoughts real quick on that, Rob. What did you, you think of that? Well, I, I thought that you were probably going to bring it up and that you were going to ask if that was too much, in which case I was going to say, well, let's look at that question. Too much for what? Because I am seeing wrestling making all these changes, and so it is what it is. You know, is it too much for my preference? Uh, maybe, you know, <laughs> is, it, uh, is it going maybe a little too far in the respect that uh, we don't want kids playing with plastic bags? It says right on the bag, this shit is not to be used as a toy. <laughs> you know, they, I guess John Moxley didn't read that. And, um, you know, it's a little, it's a, it's a bit uh, far and extreme. And if you look at it that way, as far as like kids could take after it and, you know, did they kill him? It's, I mean, that's, but, um, but like I said, for, uh, is it, is it, is it too far for what they're doing? Well, obviously not. So, you know, what I'm seeing is wrestling really like, uh, being about different things than it used to be. And so I'm curious, you know, and I'm, and, and, and going to be paying attention and studying to exactly how it's evolving at this stage, you know, from, from the different companies, because I'm seeing it, uh, become something. And, and as far as that with AEW, is it, is it going to be more about, 
um, like like uh, like a live action movie that you're that you're watching, witnessing in 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 that in that venue. Um, I don't know. So uh, definitely, I just thought it was worth talking about, you know. And um, I, I, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's I think it's pretty far. Uh, I wouldn't want a plastic bag on my head. I know that. But again, is it too far for what they're doing? No, and they're driving uh, us and the business in a certain direction that that they are doing so uh, i look at it that way yeah yeah because well i would think when they did the plastic bag spot they did that years ago with terry funk and rick flair way back in the day and, uh, yeah and that caught a lot of i know they got a lot of ire back then about it Ooh. and now um but now yeah it's causing a lot of people like people were freaked out about it everything i was kind of like yeah i wouldn't want a plastic bag on my head that's always like kind of uh, whatever but it's also like i don't know it's like you're, they're pushing the envelope a little bit and trying to make it stand out and that sure stood out so uh does it help it, it, and the burning of the house you know is kind of like also something in in, in that direction you know so yeah. mm -hmm. we're, we're you know they're gonna show us um what what they're doing as they're doing it you know what i mean so i'm not going to be a critic and uh, and say no they shouldn't be doing that but but whew, you know uh would i do that or like i said do i want that done to me no and i didn't see the burning of the house i just heard about it and, and uh maybe i enjoyed that what did you think told me last week? i did i, I uh, told you last week i enjoyed it <laughs> well well so again you know like is it is that going to be more about like you're watching like a, a drama and you know um i don't know maybe yeah we'll have to wait and see what they decide to do they're edging up on a tv deal here it seems pretty promising that they're going to get one with turner again and um so the boat what's what's the thing the boat raises all tides can you say it again rob well, the opposite uh, high tide raises all boats i love that quote i want to yeah. love that yeah, and so yeah, the wrestling's business is good now, and uh, that's why we got millions and millions of people watching this podcast right now on the peripherals. Here we are hanging out, mm -hmm. RVD show, one of the yeah. kind. One of the kind. <laughs> one of All right, kind. Cool, I just want to bring that up, uh, but let's uh, let's go ahead and finish the uh, see you later, bye byes. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Shoot. Bye. See you. See you. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye. See you.